Hello and welcome to Civi or Not to Civi. Here with us is WSU's executive chef, Jamie Callison, and assisting him tonight is Brittany. My name is Andrea Donaworth. I'm the program coordinator for Global Connections. Stay tuned with us at the end when we will announce the winner of our sous vide. So here we go. Chef Jamie, go right ahead. Perfect. Well, welcome to our, um, looks like a little science experiment here. Um, and again, Brittany, thank you so much for your help. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about sous vide. And I don't think of myself as an expert with sous vide, um, but I do know quite a bit about kind of the benefits of sous vide. It's an amazing technology. Sous vide, the, actually, the, um, the term means under pressure. So vacuum sealed, usually it's in a chamber sealer, which removes all the air. Um, a lot of home um, cooks, and we use sometimes, is, is basically just a um, vacuum sealer. Um, this works extremely well. Um, when you're using this, it's important to uh, make sure you don't have real loose liquids, because it will pull the liquid out. A chamber sealer um, pressurizes it and actually allows you to, to um, vacuum pack liquids. Um, this is a the, the poly science. This is a poly science um, um, product here, and it um, works extremely well. Um, but again, the chamber sealers um, are, are a great way to go. But they're, the chamber sealers are about um, two thousand dollars, so that becomes very expensive. The other thing you can do, um, which keeps the cost down a lot, is to use um, your Ziploc bags. Um, it's kind of a joke around my house. I'm not great at zip locking for some reason. I can't snap my fingers either, so it kind of probably goes uh, together. So um, I'm a demo hollandaise. So basically what I've done here is I've taken eggs. Um, I made the reduction, seasoned it, put everything in here with the butter and everything, except for the, um, the lemon juice. So what we're going to do now is we're, um, if I was just starting this, I cooked this at 147 degrees for a half hour. So what works really well, if you open up the vacuum and you kind of open up the, a little part of the um, seal and you push the air out as you're putting it in the water. And then what I like to do is take a huge paper clip and clip it on there. And that allows where water's definitely not gonna get in that seal, especially with my techniques of that. So what we're gonna do now for the, I really think this is, of this is the perfect hollandaise. We're going to take this, and we're going to pour this into a siphon container. It's basically a whipped cream container. We're going to pour this in here, see if I can do this um, gracefully. And so again, this has everything in it. It has your, your standard reduction, which we use um, peppercorns, shallots, vinegar, reduce that down to a glaze. And then we um, uh, add that, um, add water to that glaze to kind of infuse those flavors into the water. At that point, you can add tarragon or whatever other flavors you want. We strain it off um, into the egg, mix, egg yolk mixture. We use pasteurized egg yolks. And then we just added our butter right in with that. We didn't emulsify it. We didn't mix it. Um, and then the lemon, I've found with this technique, is if you put it in the water bath, it'll actually curdle the eggs. It'll cook the eggs as it's heating up. So we're going to add the lemon very last minute. We're going to close this up. I like to shake it around just a little bit. And then we're going to charge it. And this is going to, um, again, we didn't have to, hollandaise traditionally, you have to whisk it for a long period of time while we're adding in the butter. It's not a process that's anybody's favorite. You want to listen for the charge, and then you want to shake it. We're going to do two charges. And the nice thing about this hollandaise is after it's done, we could turn our sous vide machine down to 131 degrees. and hold it for up to an hour and a half. So we're gonna shake this again. I always like to do a little test. If you look at how the structure of that, and the beauty is when you put it on the product, it 
It kind of comes out at the very beginning, kind of uh, more foam-like, but as it heats up, it really creates a glaze. And it's amazing hollandaise. I've made hollandaise for 37 years now in my career. I will never go back to making it the other way, especially being able to hold it in the water bath. We're gonna talk about, um, I'm gonna switch around quite a bit here. So with sous vide machines, it's really important to kind of think about the, the temperature and time. So I have asparagus here. The asparagus that I have here, all we did was put a little olive oil, a little salt, a little pepper, and a little lemon zest. I have 185 degree water. We're gonna put the asparagus in there. Usually asparagus, I cook at 184 um, and a half. And I do that because I like it to stay a little bit softer. I'm, I have it at 185 right now just because I'm gonna be also doing carrots and beets too. So I'm gonna drop that right in the water. And that's gonna cook for about 15 minutes. And with vegetables, the difference between vegetables and proteins, sit there in there. vegetables and proteins, um, vegetables are all about the cell structure breakdown. So um, we're looking at how we wanna break down the cell structure. So if I get a carrot and the carrot's already really tender and soft, I'm gonna lower the temperature a little bit so that I don't break down the cell structure so much. Um, with proteins, like this wonderful steak here, um, it's all about the um, protein coagulation. So it's really important, it's totally different. You would think you would cook vegetables at a lower temperature. Vegetables take, it's about 185 degrees, almost exactly to break down the cell structure of a vegetable. So it depends on what you're gonna use it for and the approach you take. So with our steak, we're gonna put a little butter in the pan. Can I have the other steak too? Just in the bag though. And we're gonna, we're just gonna re, I'm gonna re-sear this a little bit. I seared this one ahead of time. And the reason we did that um, is to give it some flavor, but also for certain things, for steak I'm not so worried about, but it also um, cooks a lot of the bacteria off the outside. So if you have a really thick steak and you're gonna be cooking it for a very long time, we're gonna wanna cook it maybe a little bit beforehand, before we sous vide it, um, to make sure that we, we kill off some of that bacteria. The steak is cooked all the way through. So we had a little um, power problems here earlier. So hopefully when I cut into these, they're gonna be the perfect temperature. Um, this steak right here, it's a um, beautiful prime um, uh, ribeye. What I did in here is I just added a little bit of, um, this one was not seared at all. So basically, we're gonna open this one up and I just wanted to show you this. This one right here has um, a little bit of rosemary thyme. Um, we've used a little bit of everything seasoning, which is a WSU product and espresso seasoning mix. Um, now we're gonna open this up and we're gonna sear this off too. So re-searing it is gonna give it a nice, really nice texture. If you look at the, um, the searing of a steak, I was taught and most of us were taught the searing of a steak was to lock in the moisture. It is 100% opposite, gloves. 100% opposite. When you sear something, especially from the cold state, it pushes all the moisture out. The sous vide, the benefit of the sous vide is it slowly heats it up and all that moisture stays in. In a normal steak, when you're cooking a steak normally on the grill, you can lose up to um, 30, 40% sometimes of the um, content in the steak. When you're doing a sous vide, that goes from five to 10%. So you keep a lot of that moisture in. So before you resear anything from sous vide, because it's wet, we're gonna make sure that we dry it off. So I'm gonna do this with a little bit of butter basting, very in, but you wanna dry it because if you don't dry it off, what's gonna happen is instead of getting a nice crust on there, it's gonna create steam. So you really wanna dry it, whether you're just grilling your steak or doing it sous vide. The beautiful thing about sous vide too is um, all that fat and everything, instead of going out into the um, barbecue and down in the grill, it actually stays in the um, bag. And so what we do, what we like to do even at home and at work, is I like to do the thing they call the reverse sear. So what I do is I don't sear the steak at all and I'm gonna sear it afterwards. And that's the best end result for sure. If you're doing something like a ribeye and you wanna trim off some of the fat, keep that fat and put that right back in the bag. So the steak, I cooked at 132 degrees for about two hours. 
And so now we want to get a nice crust on this one. The moment of truth here. So if you look at the steak, this is cooked perfect. This is 132. This is a perfect medium rare. Um, a lot of people, if you like your steak really rare, you can go down to 128. The only thing you have to do is um, you really have to watch how long it's cooking in the temperature danger zone. So um, a thick steak like this, maximum two hours at 132, you're going to be fine. If you get down to 128, you're really going to have to manage that a little bit better and make sure if you, you definitely do not want to go over two hours because that's when bacteria starts to multiply. So I'm going to slice this real quick just so you can see a better shot of it. The other thing that I really like about the sous vide is that you, um, you don't get that, um, you don't have to wait as long. When you cook a traditional steak, you get that, you have to let it rest. Sous vide is actually rested already. And so when I cut it, we didn't get a big loss of the blood and the juices coming out of it. And that's because everything's been slowly cooked back in. Um, when you take a steak off of a hot grill, the cell structure is kind of seized up and it makes it where you have to actually um, be very careful. A lot of times if you get your steak when you're at a restaurant, it's better actually not to cut into it until um, it's rested just a little bit. So just relax, have a glass of wine, talk to your friends, enjoy it. If it comes out sizzling, definitely do not um, cut right into it. Yeah, the potatoes. So we have some potatoes here. Potatoes, we talked about what um, sous vide or not to be. Potatoes, there's no reason to sous vide them. I'm not a big fan of the texture. We have tried most things here. And um, the other day I, I read up on halibut that uh, everybody was talking about one of the best things is sous vide. We tried it multiple different temperatures and it just became mushy. So we actually ended up just doing a traditional poach on it. It came out amazing. So whenever I'm um, serving steak, you can see how beautiful and how, how nice medium rare that is. And again, looking at this, how perfectly medium rare it is all the way through. If we cook this traditional, you would have the graying effect is what we call it, where you get that perfect medium rare in, inside and then you end up with a, um, a kind of graying effect all the way through and it ends up being a little bit more rare inside sometimes than what you even want it. So we have a nice crust on this steak here. I made sure I bought some um, good sized steak so that um, I can maybe feed the crew. So for our asparagus, Again, especially when asparagus is in season, I want to make sure, and it's really tender, that I'm not overcooking this. So this is still just a little bit under. It hasn't been quite 15 minutes here. Um, so I'm gonna let this go just for a couple more minutes. And then what you can do when this is done too is you can actually grill it, which works extremely well. So you can take it right off here, throw it on the grill real quick, roast it. I did some um, oven roasted carrots recently, but I sous vide them ahead of time and just a very quick hot oven roast right away. So when you're serving steak like this, always really important to do a little finishing salt. I love mold and finishing salt. The inside of the steak is not um, um, seasoned, right? So we want to make sure that we um, put a little salt on that and it gives it a nice little pop. So I'm going to hand this over here to see if um, Mike wants to try any. Mike's our guest taster here. And he, we brought somebody in that looked kind of tough so that um, that way if he, I was afraid if I served him something that, uh, that he didn't like, I'd, I'd be in trouble. So. so now we're going to talk about the pork. Pork is one of my favorite things. Um, pork and chicken cooking sous vide is absolutely amazing. Um, the pork a lot of times gets overcooked. Um, and it, it's one of those things that people are really, really nervous about it being overcooked. Yeah, you said it right there. So, and I wanna show this to you too. This is actually 
How's the steak? Very good. Very good? Yeah. Nice. So, same exact size starting. Exact same size. So as a chef in a restaurant, <laughs> what, am I, what's, what are my guests gonna want? These started out the same size, and look at the size difference here. So when they're done, this was sous vide, and this was seared and just roasted traditional. So now what we're gonna do with this is we're gonna um, dry this off a little bit. And I'm gonna roast this off. I'm gonna pan sear this. I just put a little olive oil on there. So the pork I did at 139 degrees um, for two hours. The beautiful thing about um, pork now is we're allowed to cook it kind of medium and the people are getting used to it. I remember the first time that I served pork with a little bit of red in it, I went out and made sure I was the dinner for about 80 people, went out and explained it. Everybody absolutely loved it. I guarantee you um, 10 years ago, everybody would have sent that plate back. So um, pork definitely can be cooked nice medium. Uh, I've actually, um, I take students to Italy and France for food and wine program every year. In France, they serve pork medium rare. And I've definitely eaten it and I'm still here, so. Again, I'm not suggesting to eat pork medium rare. Follow the state codes. I'm just saying um, kind of where we're at, so. You gotta be careful I don't get in trouble here. So, this is the pork that was cooked. It's actually still nice. It has a little bit of red still in there. Um, Brittany cooked this up. Brittany cooked this off and she did an absolutely amazing job. So we're gonna put a little bit of that on the plate here. But see, it's still just, there's still, it may be hard to see, there's just a light tint of pink in there, which is what you want in the pork. So now, we're gonna remove this. And I would probably, you get a little bit of fat cap there, Searing that off is really good too. So I'm gonna let that sear for a little bit. Now I'm gonna showcase the asparagus. So it's funny, at our house we will um, not eat pork anymore unless it's um, been sous vide. It just, um, I did a, a dinner this summer in Tri-Cities. I did two back-to-back -back auction dinners. Everybody at the table all bought a sous vide machine. I, Anova's a great brand. PolyScience is what you use um, for mass production and bigger um, operations, but there's a lot of really good brands out there. Um, the average sous vide machine 10 years ago was about $600. Now you can find them for about 80 to 100, which is, which is amazing. A lot of people are concerned about the plastics um, and saying, how can you cook something in plastic that's dangerous? Um, some plastics, it is. Make sure you buy, if you're gonna do Ziploc bags, buy a good brand. Um, I'm not gonna, I, sh I shouldn't be saying any companies, but the Ziploc brand and all those, those brands that are really famous, they use safe plastics that are safe to cook in. If you buy a really cheap plastic or you buy a plastic and of course you microwave in it, you can have some, some issues. Um, so definitely buying the good quality and the um, Food Saver, um, all the bags that are sold for sous vide um, in, in the US, are all safe to cook with. So this asparagus is actually absolutely amazing, perfect to eat right now. You can do a quick little saute. I like adding a little bit of color to it. So the pork, because um, some of the, the beautiful thing about the pork too, is we had this big fat cap on here. This did render off in the cooking process, but it rendered off and then the juices cooked right back into it. I mean, you, you can see the difference in the sizes of it being cooked, um, traditional. And this is gonna have a lot more even. This has a little bit of red in the middle. This is perfect. Um, I actually sometimes like my pork just a little bit more red. The problem is in a couple minutes, this is actually gonna show a little bit more um, pink to it as it sets. But this is cooked absolutely perfect. So this will be a, um, a fun taste test right here. I'm actually gonna cut this a little bit easier. So uh, Mike will get the opportunity to try side by side the pork.
We probably need to bring a microphone over for him. <laughs> Where's the steak? Can you bring me the steak plate? Um, I, what's that? You soaked this for, for how long? So this was actually just, it was cooked in the sous vide for two hours. Okay. So this one right here was marinated for um, 12 hours just to give it a fighting chance. Um, but um, yeah, this, so this one was the sous vide and you can see it's definitely a lot tougher. And you saw the size difference of it, right? Absolutely. I mean, it's, um, when we cooked it, I mean, it's amazing how much it cooked down. I mean, it was, and it's, and it's decent. But, and this one does have that pink tint to it, but it's okay, that's what it should. But it's evenly pink all the way through. Oh wow, that's very tender. It's, it's a lot, lot better flavor and a lot better, well at least I think so. We'll see what Mike has to say. Mm. All that flavor cooks into that it. That is absolutely amazing, the difference. Yeah, the, 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 yeah, the mic <clears> that up. is like absolutely amazing on, on the difference of how it holds the flavor. You can really tell the difference in moisture content. Exactly. Well, and the moisture content and actually the flavor of the food. The beef is gonna be a, a lot more apparent. The asparagus flavor is gonna be amazing. The pork flavor, it's just gonna be more apparent. So it really helps. Where's the beef that I dished up? Okay. Yeah, the one I dished up. So the asparagus, that's okay. So the asparagus, I wanted to show you this. This is gonna have some nice color on it. And so sous vide, of course, it's, it has a lot of moisture, right? We're not, we're not roasting it. But with sous vide, at the very end, I do like to do sear. That's okay. Whoa. So we get nice color on there. I would suggest most people don't reach into the, um, the, pot, the pan like that, but after cooking for so many years, I've built up a lot of calluses. Um, but this is just beautiful. And can you see how bright the color is? We did not blanch this at all. We vacuum packed it, seasoned it, a little bit of lemon, all that flavor cooks right in. And for vegetables, this is absolutely amazing. Do we have any um, questions or? We, we, need, we need some questions. We have eight minutes on veggies. Eight minutes on veggies, okay. So now we're gonna go into, um, well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna show the chicken real quick. And then the salmon's almost done. So chicken's one of the things that I always do uh, um, pre-sear on it um, for a couple reasons. One is um, it changes its shape. So if I did not sear this at all, it's really strange. The chicken just kind of pulls together and it really becomes kind of a, a funny shape, which makes it very, very hard to sear at the end. So what I like to do is um, I, I cook this. My temperature that I cook it at is a little higher than what a lot of people recommend. So I, I really believe 149 um, degrees for two hours. I have tried it. There's people out there that say cook it at 140, 143. You get quite a bit of pink left in it. So, um, but this has a nice sear on there. Um, fried chicken, I absolutely love doing this way. Dark meat, you need to cook it about 160 um, degrees in, the, in here. And we brine it just like you would overnight. Cook it sous vide and then we dredge it in the flour and then the buttermilk, or the buttermilk and then the flour and then back in the buttermilk and the flour to make it really crispy, the seasoned flour. Then we fry it, but we only have to fry it for about three minutes. I don't wanna say it's low fat fried chicken, but it's a lot less greasy and it stays crisp a lot longer because you're not getting it saturated with that fat. Um, I would be a little concerned if, if the product that you have is um, not totally submerged um, for some things. The carrots, this is definitely going to be fine. You can weigh them down, and again, that paperclip method actually works pretty good to kind of hold it. The more air you get out of it, the better. And that's why chamber sealers are the best way to go because it pulls all the air out. However, I think the, the uh, less, uh, least expensive machine is about $1,500 and it's the size of two bread machines. So it takes up a lot of space. But when you're cooking it, you know, and, and here right now I have my herbs, my butter, my salt, pepper, all those flavors are just slowly cooking into those carrots and stuff, which is absolutely amazing. So um, it, yeah, I would try to get it to where it's kind of floating, maybe move it around a little bit too. So most things like a heavy steak or something like that, you see like the chicken and stuff, it actually sinks down into it, right? So now I think my salmon, it's time for my salmon. 
So the salmon, we cooked at 115 degrees, uh, or 117 degrees. Most people say one, um, 115. It be, I love my salmon. I worked with a Japanese chef. I love my salmon to be really, really oblique in the middle, really um, uh, moist in the middle. However, most people want the salmon to start to get a little cook on it, so on the inside. So we're gonna, um, I, 117, if you have people coming over or you're making it, you, you have somebody that doesn't want that kind of raw salmon texture, I would definitely recommend it. Um, this is actually the first time I have ever cooked salmon um, sous vide. Um, we cook salmon once a week at home. I know you're thinking, how brave can he be? He's doing this first time on, on a live video stream. Um, we usually do ours just where we marinate it, get a hot cast iron pan, put it in there for, um, flip until it's brown on both sides, put it in the oven for about six minutes and it's absolutely perfect. Um, but I wanted to try this. We did test it today and it, um, I tested at 115, again, for an hour. Um, I, again, love my salmon to be definitely nice and um, not over, I really am not a big fan of overcooked fish. So we're gonna set this down down here. Remember all the product that we've set on here has been cooked. So we're gonna dry this off again, just a tiny bit. There's oil in the pan and the salmon has quite a bit of oil too. Same thing, if I were to cook this traditional, this would be a lot smaller. So I cooked really small pieces. So we're gonna get a little sear in there. I love that sound of that sear in the pan. So the salmon, it's not gonna take very long. We're just gonna get a little color on it. I always like to use these, these kind of fish spatulas. They work really well. So the beautiful thing is this salmon is cooked 100% all the way through. All, we don't have to worry about overcooking it. Now we can actually take it, brown it, get it out of the pan, and it's absolutely perfect. One thing I would recommend at home too is build a little file of your own recipes for sous vide. It's, you know, there's a lot of information out there, the web, amazing websites. I'm on the computer all the time trying to come up with new ideas. Um, write down the, the temperatures that your family likes it. Um, it's really important so you don't say, oh, that was perfect this time. And then two months down the road, you don't remember what it was. So, so again, this is a nice little sear on here. See the color on there? So all I'm doing is giving it nice texture. Again, sous vide is amazing technology. You still have to follow the basic cooking principles of seasoning it properly, um, making sure you get the right texture. Like cooking a steak 100% sous vide without searing it, yes, it's gonna be a perfect medium rare. Is it gonna be the texture that you like? Probably not. Again, all personal preference. So the other thing about cooking it this way too, is just like everything else that we did, you're going to have this perfect, this perfectly cooked salmon and all the flavors are gonna be locked in. I love finishing my food with just a little bit of finishing salt. Um, don't need to talk about brands, but Malden finishing salt is one of my favorites. It has good minerality very little, uh, it doesn't have that strong salty kind of aftertaste that a lot of finishing salts have. So I'm gonna break this open. I'll let you kind of see, this is actually, this is perfect. Um, it's really glossy inside. This is, it's actually firm, so it's not rubbery inside. So I would say we, the 117 test worked, so you were part of my test tonight. We did 115 earlier and it was still just a little rubbery. The 117, this is beautiful. It's glossy, a lot of moisture left in there. This is gonna be a, a nice piece of fish. I don't get to eat it till later, so. You ready to try some salmon? So again, like with the beef, you're gonna get more of that salmon flavor because the salmon's actually, instead of all that flavor going out in the pan, and you, the oil loss, the oil, um, I love duck comfy. So sous vide in a lot of ways is like comfy where you're cooking in fat because the fat comes out of the salmon but it stays in the bag and it cooks back into the salmon and it adds a lot of flavor to it.
And this has no lemon on it, no, just really simple. Okay, so I grew up in Kansas. <clears throat> There's nothing like being demasculated on television. And uh, I really thought I had a grip around the grill, around the kitchen. Our next family reunion, I get to take a whole new ball game to town. I really appreciate this. Thank oh, you very thank much, you. Chef. So the salmon was good? Oh, my goodness. This, I'm going to take this back here with <laughs> you. Yeah, absolutely. And, and that's part of it is it, um, you're actually showcasing, you know, a lot of this from electric cuisine, you know, the foams. Of course, I, I use some of that today with the hollandaise, but it's, it's a better product. I, we do some encapsulation of product, and we do some kind of fun, unique things here to teach the students the modern technology. Sous vide is no longer modern technology. Sous vide is a piece of equipment that everybody should have in their kitchen. It's absolutely amazing. And the nice thing about the new sous vide machines, like these brands here, is you can actually put them in, a, in your um, cabinet, and they're not taking up a lot of space. The original ones were the size of a bread machine. And, um, it's just, and the price has just went down dramatically so that people can afford it. So, so vegetables. Um, I actually didn't do vegetables for a long time. I did a dinner down in um, Sonoma, California. We do an annual dinner down there. They, it was the time of year when it was in spring. The vegetables were absolutely amazing. So we kind of did a sous vide project down there. Um, uh, the owner, Brian Wise and, and Rhonda West, took us down there. Absolutely amazing. We had, they had sous vide machines. Their friends brought over their sous vide machines. We had beets cooking like eight different temperatures for different times. Um, and we just had a lot of fun. And so with the carrot, um, I love carrots. Carrots, I like cooking at 185 because these are still, these are cooked really nice, but they're not, um, you have to be really careful because if you cook, don't cook them enough and you serve them for dinner like we do for 85 people, you can have a problem because they're shooting across the table. The beets are absolutely amazing this way, nice and tender. Um, so, and again, if we wanted to cook these longer, we could, but for vegetables, I like to cook them at this stage right here because I'm going to roast them a little bit more too. I want to add, I mean, this is, these are absolutely beautiful, but I want to add some color to them. So we're going to add, we're going to cook the carrots a little bit more, get some color to them. And it's amazing that how long they cooked. I wanted to show you the moisture here. There's hardly any moisture that came out. As soon as that's brown, I would add that moisture right back in there. So I wouldn't lose that. We're gonna get a little bit of color on these carrots. We're gonna salt them just a little bit more because I really didn't salt them very much. Let them brown a little bit more. Again, I'm gonna reserve that liquid, pour it in there after they're brown. So one of the, um, the best things I ever served here was ironic. I did nothing too. I got some beets from our um, organics farm here at WSU. All we, I, taste, I believe in tasting vegetables before you cook them. It, you know, if you're gonna do a glazed carrot and your carrot's already sweet, why would you add a bunch of sugar to it? And why would you glaze it? Um, or you can still glaze it, but using a lot less, of, less sugar. Um, also, if it's really tender, you're gonna cook it less. So I would never cook a really tender, fresh vegetable out of the garden at 185 degrees. I would start maybe even sometimes taking that down to 183 just to kind of cook it a little bit to kind of let it absorb some of those flavors. One of the best things I ever served was I went, I got, some, I received some beets from WSU, olive oil, salt, pepper, a little bit of lemon on them, tuck them, served them with lamb, amazing lamb. It was an amazing dish. Went out to the dining room, asked the guests how they liked the food, and all they talked about was the beets. And like, what did you do to those beets? It's like, I didn't even cook them, no heat at all. Raw beets on the plate, room temperature, served with lamb, amazing. So again, all these recipes are, should be inspirations. And in those inspirations, kind of uh, make judgment calls, especially right now, the vegetables that we're getting in, these, these kind of um, early winter, kind of late fall vegetables are absolutely amazing. I, I of course, believe in local product. Um, I think it's, um, you know, it's important to support local economy. Um, I received these carrots and a bunch of other product from uh, a bunch of local farmers last week. And I, it was probably one of the most exciting deliveries I've ever had. Everything that from the tomatoes to the carrots to everything just smelled absolutely and tasted absolutely amazing. The tomatoes actually probably should never have been um, sold. They were so good that I never want to eat another tomato again. So. Chef, I 
Yes. Pair duck with the sous vide method. I have um, duck works um, decently. I, the duck I find that um, I like doing duck more like after I've made like a duck ragu or something, reheating it together and, and having all those flavors come together. Um, duck has so much fat that a lot of times I like to render that fat off and, and cook it more traditional. If I'm doing duck confit, I'll do it really slow in the oven. Um, but it would definitely work in sous vide really well. One of the few proteins that I've um, tried that did not work out was um, rabbit. Rabbit, just the texture of it um, was not good. A couple weeks ago, I think I, I don't know if I talked about the scallops yet, but um, not scallops, but the halibut. You know, we were, like I said, we were really excited about doing the halibut and, and we looked up the recipes and we got excited and we cooked it and we cooked it multiple different ways, different time, different temperatures. And by the end, it was just absolutely, we figured it was no way, it was just mush. So we really worked hard to, um, to try it. We did this butter poached um, halibut, but then we decided that, um, that we needed to approach it more traditional way. So again, sous vide is not for everything, um, but I found that, um, again, vegetables are something I've just started really diving into. Um, I am not a sous vide expert, but um, we do a lot of sous vide here. And um, you know, people talk about the safety of it. I think in a lot of ways, if you, if you deal with it right, it's a lot safer than traditional cooking because you know the exact time and you know the exact temperature, and you know that it's cooked. And so it really works well. So we have our, our carrots there. We're gonna do our chicken next. So carrots, again, we sous vide them. We have some beautiful color on there. And then we're gonna um, show the chicken with these. Chicken is, um, we actually do the um, sous vide method for just about everything for chicken um, that we do here. Um, it's the safest way to cook it. It's for sure gonna be cooked all the way through. Really nice texture. Um, again, dark meat, you cook at a higher temperature. Again, I'm giving you recommendations. So this chicken, it's cooked. It's really moist still inside but there's definitely no um, redness to it. And again, there's some, a lot of people out there that say you don't need to cook it as far as what I'm doing right now. Um, but there, if you cook it any less than the 149, there will be a slight redness to it. People do not like red chicken. Um, so by doing it this way, we marinate it um, for overnight and just uh, in wine, herbs like rosemary, thyme, garlic, um, little um, olive oil, and it comes out absolutely amazing. So are we ready to, to try some more? So again, the chicken, it, the flavor is gonna cook into it, and you're not gonna have that kind of, the dryness that effect that you're gonna have in a lot of chicken, so. Now, Chef, I know that you authored a book, yes. uh, a book that I think Andrea actually has up here. Um, and some of your, your chocolates. Did you make these chocolates as well? So the chocolates, um, my head chocolatier is out there packaging chocolates right now. So these chocolates are um, Chris Con Confections. I was the faculty advisor for this. Jessica Murray, one of our grad students, worked with us on us, who's the main kind of um, student lead on this. Um, so the, all these are hand dipped, handmade by WSU students. Um, the marketing team, entrepreneurship team, engineering team, food science team, hospitality, marketing. Everybody worked on this project together and it's absolutely amazing. So we're in the process of making 50,000 chocolates right now. Wow. Um, so we're, um, we're pretty busy with this project, but it's all, they're all natural ingredients. Um, each one of these are hand dipped and handmade by the students. It's a great way to give students an opportunity to get that real experience of, of producing a product, selling it, marketing it. So we're really, really excited about this product. And the holidays are coming. Absolutely, a beautiful package, beautiful candy. Now, are any of these recipes that we're going through this evening in your book that you have here? Um, there are a couple. So the um, pork um, sous vide actually is in here, and it's the pork dish. So it's, um, that's in here. Um, I don't think a lot of the other recipes, I think we did sous vide was the, the main one that we did in there. But this um, book showcases WSU, the organics farm, the orchard, the cattle ranch, honey production, um, of course, what we do here. And so it's a great way, like the creamery, of course, it's a great way to kind of um, 
uh, have kind of a coffee table cookbook. All the recipes are approachable. You, you can get, if we couldn't buy the product on the Palouse, it did not go in the book. So um, we're really proud about that. So, um, because I think that so many chefs write a cookbook and it's like, they want to come up with these names and these creative things that nobody knows what they are. It's a great way to teach people certain things, but don't shock and awe them and, and make it where they don't have to go on Amazon and spend $80 for a little jar or something that you figured out. It's just not fair so to the consumer. So we wanted a coffee table cookbook that had a lot of stains in it was the idea. Well, I can tell you this. My mother-in-law got this as a gift last year, Mother's Day weekend. She has not stopped raving and ranting about it. I had to get it autographed. I probably shouldn't have said that. That's this year's Christmas <laughs> present. So, Chef, I just want to say one thing about the carrots. Maybe growing up, watching mom and grandma boil carrots, I really expected a, a mushy, boiled, nasty carrot taste. This actually had some crunch to it. I yeah, am yeah. extremely impressed. Yeah. And that's great because we can control that, right? So if we wanted it, we could cook it a little bit further and a little bit longer, but I like this texture, especially with the roast on it because it gives it a nice texture. Now, again, if I was gonna serve this out in the dining room, I'd probably cook it just a little bit longer so it didn't shoot across the table, but I like that texture of carrots. I'm, that's one of the things that I was a kid, I would eat a, almost anything. Cook carrots, I would sit at the table for hours it's like, just give me a raw carrot. But doing it this way, you really get that. Oh, no, this is, this is fabulous. And I actually think I found a way for Andrew and I to get our daughters to eat their cooked carrots now. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you. So I think um, if we don't have any other questions, um, I think we're about ready to do a little um, prize giveaway. And But I, I want to thank all of you for um, tuning in. Brittany? Come here. I want to thank Brittany. She's been doing a great job of kind of um, running back and forth and grabbing stuff for us. And so um, she helped set all this stuff up and helped do a lot of the cooking. And um, so I, it's all about the students. So whenever we do something like this, we love to involve the students. And she's one of my um, top culinary leads right now. We actually started a culinary certificate program here at WSU. She's one of the first students going through that. And so she's actually kind of working on two degrees right now. So I'm really proud to have her by my side. And thank you so much. <laughs> She loves the attention too. So yes, we are going oh, to pick. Oh, you can pull the name out of that. Oh yeah, we're gonna pick a winner for the sous vide. So go ahead, drum roll. I can't do it, but la 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 la. <laughs> Kathleen Dillard. Kathleen Dillard. Oh, congratulations. Congratulations, if you need any hints, you know where to stop in, right? So um, again, this has been absolutely amazing. Hopefully you learned some things. And again, I would recommend definitely getting a sous vide machine and, and experimenting around with it. Um, your family will help you decide on how far you want to cook things. But there's great resources from the Anova website, uh, Modernist Cuisine, um, and just getting online and, and just type in sous vide um, temperatures. Um, and read through some of the results. If you don't like little pink in your chicken, there's a lot of people that cook chicken now that has a little bit of pink in it. I prefer the pink not to be there. So, um, you know, and so that's again, a personal preference. And um, so with fish, a lot of people, the way we cook the salmon, I love that temperature. It's absolutely perfect. Some people, it would definitely be a little um, um, undercooked. However, even if you cooked it further, that moisture would still be in the salmon and that flavor would still be in there. So if you wanna, my philosophy as a chef, if somebody wants a well done steak, I am happy to serve it for them. So when we do well done steak like this, people are blown away. We'll actually cook it well done. So you have to cook it about 149 and then you flash it on a grill, get really some good texture on it. And I'm proud, if I can make somebody's day happy and make them a lot happier and make their evening special, that's what I should do. And so this, these machines have helped me become a better chef, better culinarian. Um, you cannot overcook the steak. If you set the temperature at 132, now if you left it in there too long, it could become unsafe and the texture would change. But let's say you left the steak in there for an extra 15 or 20 minutes or your chicken, the texture will start to change, but it will not overcook. The vegetables, the same thing. Yes, the textures may change, but you cannot overcook the steak. You can leave it in there, don't do this because you probably wouldn't feel very well for a long time. You can cook, leave it in there for three days and it would still be medium rare. It would not be edible, but just to kind of give you an idea, it's more about the protein coagulation and how it, it, it basically what happens is once it gets to that level, it plateaus and it will not cook anymore. Again, textures change. Braised products, we didn't get into that today. 
Um, amazing, uh, 165 to 185 degrees, works absolutely amazing. You, you cook your product the way you normally would, and then you, you put it into a, um, uh, you chill it. Anytime you vacuum pack anything, it has to be below 41 degrees. So really watch the safety um, things on there because bacteria will start to multiply really fast if it's too warm and you, um, you seal it up. So stay safe, enjoy sous vide, and go Cougs. Thank you.